with that, I'm going to kick us off to our first keynote speaker, Dr. Rich Barron. And so let me um, read off a quick introduction for you. So uh, Dr. Rich Barron is a board for, sort of, is, is board certified in internal medicine and geriatric medicine, and he's the president and CEO of the American Board of Internal Medicine and the ABIM Foundation. Uh, Dr. Barron practiced general internal medicine and geriatrics for almost 30 years at Greenhouse Internist PC located in Philadelphia. Greenhouse was a pioneer in the comprehensive adoption of electronic health records in the small practice environment. Following that, from 2011 to 2013, he served as group director of seamless care models at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services Innovation Center, where he led efforts related to accountable care organizations and primary care. Joining, until joining the federal government, Dr. Barron also served on the board of the National Quality Forum and their Health Information Technology Advisory Committee, as well as the Standards Committee of the National Committee for Quality Assurance. Um, it's my honor to welcome him to our conference and, uh, and on a to speaking on the topic of opportunities and promise for practice-based research. Dr. Barron. And thank you very much for that introduction. And uh, it was really wonderful to hear Ray talk about the potential in front of all of us as we think about practice-based research. And the major thing I'm going to focus on uh, it is some aspect of the why and a little bit of the how uh, of, of how to realize some of this promise, because it's been out there for a long time. And the idea of somehow engaging people in practice in research. And, uh, and, and whenever I see a situation where it's so obvious that something ought to happen, but it isn't happening, the question I ask myself is, what are the barriers that keep it from happening and how could we get past those barriers? As Anne said, uh, these days I run the American Board of Internal Medicine, the ABIM Foundation. I, I do some precepting of residents in Pennsylvania Hospital in Philly, but I'm not seriously involved in clinical medicine the way that I was, as Anne mentioned, also for 30 years in my career, where I practiced uh, three blocks from where I live in Philadelphia, in the Mount Airy section of Philadelphia. And our practice uh, was one of the early adopters of electronic health records we adopted in 2004. It was actually the most challenging thing I ever did in the course of my career. We, we almost lost our practice over it. And uh, it, it, but it, I, one of the reasons why I did it was because I'd had a shadow career in leadership in Medicaid managed care uh, from the late 80s uh, to the late 90s. And so I spent in those years of my life um, sitting in an office in the HMO telling people what to do, and the other half of my life sitting in a clinical practice office taking care of friends, neighbors, and colleagues being told what to do. And straddling those worlds uh, gave me a, a real appreciation for some of the opportunities that people in the administrative world had um, and, and some of the opportunities that people in the practice world had and spending a lot of time thinking about how to put those two together, which was part of why we were early adopters of electronic health records. And I think the major thing I'm going to try to get across, and I'm going to be drawing on the years in practice and the kinds of things I was doing then more than what I'm doing exactly right now, but I think that we need to have a kind of mind shift among people in practice um, in a way that isn't actually that big a reach, but it's a big enough reach that if people don't get some help making it, I think a lot of people don't make it. What do I mean when I talk about a mind shift? So those of us in practice, uh, we're, we're seeing our patients one at a time. Um, we are taking care of them as they come in and, uh, and we're doing the best job that we can uh, trying to unite the knowledge and expertise that we have with the needs that patients have. And early in my career, uh, as I was discovering the potential of having uh, an electronic health record in practice, I, I would speak about some of the early models, the patient center medical home models and so on to primary care audiences. And one of the things that you could do, you, you could ask a group of primary care doctors, 
um, okay, how many of you know what the recommendations are for mammography? Um, and, and they would all raise their hand. And in those years, you know, any woman between 50 and 65 was supposed to get a mammogram every year. And every primary care doctor could tell you that. Everyone could. But if you ask that same group, okay, how many of you could tell me the rate at which the women you saw last year who were between age 50 and 65 got a mammogram? In those years, people would look absolutely quizzically dumbfounded blank looks. And, uh, and some of them would say, well, how would I know that? And of course, in a world when they were practicing on paper, they didn't have any way to know that. They didn't have any way to know that at all. And the question that I found myself asking them was, okay, I get that you don't know that now. But the question I would ask you is, if you did know that, would that tell you something important about your practice? And when people had an opportunity to think about that, invariably they said, absolutely. Because nobody goes to work in, as a primary care doctor not to offer patients the services that they know they're supposed to be offering. But most people working in that environment don't actually have access to numerator denominator data that would tell them how effectively they are achieving the goals that they go to work to do. And this is kind of an ironic situation when you think about it, because, of course, our entire evidence base, the way in which our, our clinical colleagues are deciding what antihypertensive to use or how to manage diabetes, that entire evidence base is coming from numerator denominator data, which exists in the research setting. When somebody does a, a trial of antihypertensives, they're taking a bunch of people and uh, offering some of them the drug and some of them not the drug. And they're doing various kinds of numerical analyses that are fundamentally rate-based numerator denominator data. And they're saying the people who got this drug are doing did better than the people who didn't. And so clinical colleagues, what it means to be a modern scientific, in fact, board certified doctor in this era is that your practice is guided by knowledge that is generated that way. It's knowledge generated from numerator denominator data. But we, and it used to only be available in the clinical research setting, but now, of course, with electronic platforms being core to practice and various kinds of people out there trying to generate this sort of data, numerator denominator data is more a, a fact of current practice. But the connection between the doctors practicing and that numerator denominator data is still pretty tenuous. What do I mean by that? Well, first of all, uh, those data may be generated by their insurance company those data, in which case, uh, if it's the insurance company generating the data, they're, they're looking at only a fraction of the patients that the doctor is taking care of. So when Blue Cross sends a report, it's about Blue Cross patients. It doesn't include Aetna patients or Medicare patients. So doctors have a hard time responding to quality data that might be coming at them from insurers, even though insurers are investing significant resources in generating these kinds of quality data. So it's fragmented. I think another real challenge in getting uh, doctors into this game is what I think we all have to admit is a, a flawed execution of the Meaningful Use Program at scale. Now, I said I adopted in 2004, and we did, and we wrote about it in the Annals of Internal Medicine. It was, it was just, as I said earlier, it was a near-death experience for the practice. It was really hard. And I argued in that, in that article that if we were going to get doctors into this space, we were gonna to have to fund it one way or another because for primary care doctors, uh, the, the work was enormous, the cost was enormous, and the returns were not enormous. In fact, our first year implementing electronic health record, our, our productivity went down, we were billing less, and our costs went up. That's not a recipe for success implementation. So the federal government stepped in and created the Meaningful Use Program, and we went from 5% adoption to 90 plus percent adoption over less than a decade. But if you ask yourself the question, who taught doctors how to use electronic health records? You get to a really sad answer. 
Because the reality is that the most influential voice in most clinical offices during adoption were the compliance officers talking about meaningful use and saying, here's what you have to do to assure that we can get, that we can get paid for your adoption of electronic health records. And if you think about that, that would be as if, uh, after all, an MRI or a CAT scan generating that image relies on computer processing of a bunch of radiologic signals to generate an image. That would be as if radiation safety officers were the ones who instructed radiologists how to use MRIs in clinical practice or how to use CT scans in clinical practice. The reality was with MRIs and CT scans and, and ultrasounds, doctors pointed that information technology at a clinical problem they cared about and asked themselves the question, can this help us solve that problem? Uh, can we use ultrasound to help us manage acute cholecystitis? Uh, does an MRI help diagnose stroke? These are the kinds of questions that clinicians using information technology were asking, but the way we implemented electronic health records in practice, well, uh, we, didn't, we didn't have it, it didn't unlock physicians' natural curiosity. It wasn't designed to solve problems that they actually thought they had. And as a result, uh, they were relegated to a position of trying to feed the electronic health record so that somebody else could use the data. And that wound up being problematic too. Another early experience in our practice taught us the importance of structured data. Shortly after we adopted, as I said, I'd worked in the insurance side. I was familiar with numerator denominator data. It was like, okay, let's go ahead and, and look at the number of women in our office who haven't had mammograms in the last year. Let's generate a report. Let's send them a letter to try to, this is very early QI stuff for sure. We were geniuses. We're going to send them a letter. We send out all these letters and we start getting phone calls from patients saying, I don't know why I got this letter because not only did I get a mammogram, but I got a letter from your office last week that told me it was normal. Why are you now telling me I should get a mammogram? And when we looked into that, what we discovered was that mammograms entered the chart as scanned documents. They didn't enter the chart as structured data. Some of us understood the importance of structured data and would, would take the steps so that the EHR knew that that scan document was a mammogram. Some of us didn't. Well, I originally thought the ones of us who did were really smart because we understood what information technology could do. But then I realized that it took 13 mouse clicks to structure that piece of data that had come in as a mammogram and that we, the primary care doctors, were doing all those, those mouse clicks. And we realized, wait, we have to create a, a job description for somebody to do that kind of work. So the lack of structured data in the practice situation limits the kind of reports that people can get uh, and trying to do things that, that when frontline clinicians have access to data, that can be helpful. But there is a huge opportunity for, uh, for the kind of research you're all gonna be doing to help patients and a huge opportunity to engage frontline clinicians by appealing to their desire to do a better job taking care of their patients. So when I tell the mammogram story, if, if I get a report from Aetna that says, here's your mammography rate, I, I, I can discount it as being something imposed on me. But if I have an opportunity to ask a question about how well am I doing something in my practice, now you've got my interest. And the more opportunities that you all have to structure your work around the things that the doctors are actually interested in, focused on, care about, the better off you will be. And I'll give an example of the kind of power of the, the work that you can do. And Ray referenced the way in which some of this implementation science, implementation work can be more powerful than some traditional biomedical research. One of the things that we found annoying in primary care practice was we would refer patients to a specialist and we'd give them a, a name and a phone number and say, we think you should see this doctor. And then a couple of days later, we would get a phone call from the patient saying, well, I reached out to get that appointment, but the doctor can't see me for six weeks. But they said that if the primary care office called and pleaded, I could get an earlier appointment. Well, I found that incredibly annoying and frustrating. It's like, first of all, I am trying to refer you business. You're the one who's 
in the business of being a whatever, and I'm sending you a patient, and now you're making the patient call me to plead with you to see that, like, that's crazy. So as I thought about ways we could do this differently, we realized now that we were on an electronic platform, if we could find a medical office that would accept electronic referrals, we could send a referral electronically to the, to the office and we could say to them, now you have the information, you figure out what to, when to schedule this patient. Don't ask me how soon you need to see them. You have the clinical information, you can decide. Well, in those years, it actually was hard to find offices that would accept referrals electronically, but our GI group was forward thinking and they were accepting referrals electronically. And so we wound up referring all our GI patients electronically. At least some of us in the practice did. Some of the doctors in the practice used the electronic referral. Some of the doctors didn't. And then we realized, hey, wait, the highest volume referral that we're sending to the GI doctors is for colonoscopies. And the standard workflow had been, you say to the patient, you need a colonoscopy, here's the phone number, we'll give you a piece of paper with some information about you to bring to the GI doctor. And as you can imagine, patients were not uh, reliably excited about scheduling a procedure that they weren't that interested in having anyway, that was going to be uncomfortable. And so a fair number of them never picked up the phone and called. But when we had done electronic referrals to the GI office, now we'd created a completely different dynamic. Now the GI office, which earned substantial money doing this procedure, it was in their hands to find these patients and reach out to them. And needless to say, their staff was a lot more aggressive in making appointments with the patients than the patients walking out of our office were in making the patients for, appointments for themselves. And we realized that we had created the conditions for a natural study in our office. Some of the doctors in the practice had referred using the electronic uh, workflow. Others had referred using the standard paper workflow. Was there a difference in the rate of completed colonoscopies? And we actually had the data in our practice to answer that question because we had the colonoscopy reports from the patients who got them and we didn't have the reports from the ones who didn't. And uh, I, I wish I had had any of you as colleagues at that time. In fact, what I had was a resident who uh, uh, rotating through our office from Temple who was looking for a quality project to do. And I put her on this. I said, you could do this. You could, you could go through all this stuff. And she did. And it turned out that the electronic referral pathway generated a 40% higher completed colonoscopy rate than the paper pathway. 40% improvement in the rate of completed colonoscopies just from changing a workflow in the office. And right around that time she made that finding, there was a piece in the New England Journal that, uh, that documented a new technology for diagnosing colon cancer, uh, which was at that time, uh, let's, let's collect an entire stool in some special preservative container, send it to a lab, pay over $1,000 at that time, the price is now down around 500, and let's do DNA analysis of that stool to see if we can find uh, the KRAS gene form of that suggests uh, a dysplastic polyp or malignant cancer. The article got published in, in the New England Journal of Medicine because whereas hemocult, the standard uh, approach, uh, found 10 out of 71 cancers or dysplastic polyps, the DNA analysis found 29 out of 71. Wow, triple the rate. But that 71 denominator, that was all of the dysplastic polyps or colon cancers found in that population, which of course were found with colonoscopy. And the idea that just by changing workflow in a practice, you could get dramatically increased effects of screening, that was really exciting. So we could have published it if we'd had colleagues like you, but we didn't. Um, and, and there were various aspects of of the journey that you need to be on to get an article published in a peer review in a peer review journal that we had not successfully done. So I think that the mind shift that I'm inviting you to think about is start trying to design systems that allow frontline clinicians to identify questions that are important to them and engage with you in finding help to solve them. 
Some of the problem they have is tools. Uh, we're still not in the place where they have free interaction with their electronic health records and, and even able to generate the kinds of reports that we were able to generate in our practice 15 years ago uh, by querying our own electronic health record. But I, IHI in, in defining principles of, of uh, best practices for adoption of electronic health records, if the end clinical users are able to query for questions that they have, that gives them a stake in paying attention to the way things get documented and caring about the rate at which they achieve stuff. So I think that's important. And you may be able to help them. I know you feel like you don't have any, any juice with the IT people or with the analytic people, but you may be closer to some of the analytic people in the systems you're working in than the primary care doctors are. And if you can position yourselves as allies in helping the primary care doctors get access to those kinds of analyses, that could be helpful. And I'm going to close with a story uh, again, from the early adoption of technology, uh, in in the in the Bush years, uh, there was funding for electronic health records, but not for adoption of electronic health records. There was funding to study. Uh, how you could get offices to adopt electronic health records. And David Brailer, uh, who was the, the first uh, national coordinator of health information technology, had a very small uh, amount of funding that he could give out to state organizations to try to see how you could get doctors interested in adopting electronic health records. And a friend and colleague in Arkansas, a guy named Bill Golden, uh, had the highest rate of information technology adoption of any state under the program that Brailler, uh, that Brailler had. And the way that he achieved that, I think is instructive and, and maybe inspirational for you. What he invested in was a two person team of a, a nurse clinician and a practice manager that he sent to offices that were willing to let him do a site visit. And, and he was flying under the, we're interested in trying to help people think about adopting electronic health records. And what we will do is we will come to your office. And he sends this team to the office that spent a day on site. Um, and at the end of the day, the exit conference with the doctor looked something like this. Well, we've been observing your practice today. And here are the 10 things that we've seen that you hate, that you really don't like, that you're really frustrated by, that if you were on an electronic platform, these things would go away. These problems would be solved. And my guess is that if you began work with frontline clinicians asking them what things about their practice would they like to know more about, what things about their practice do they care about? What areas do they wish they were doing better? If the conversation starts there, if they have agency, if they are actors, then I think you will find that you will have willing folks who not only want to work with you and let you into their space to, to become collaborators, research collaborators with them, you will have people who are enthusiastic and excited and you will do a better job identifying problems where there are care gaps because the folks closest to the care are certainly the ones who are most aware of where those care gaps are. That was, uh, th that was Bill's experience experience bills of learning was that that really the people in practice do know what their problems are. They do know where they're falling short. If you can position yourselves as allies, colleagues, people who will help them address questions that they are trying to address, I think you will be much more successful than if you just sort of drop out of the sky as uh, we're from the practice-based research network and we have some questions we're hoping you will help us answer. I think if you can generate a, a governance structure, an engagement structure, a conversational structure that emphasizes the agency of the clinicians in practice and appeals to their curiosity and their desire to do the right thing, I think you will be uh, much more effective in, in advancing practice in New Jersey and in creating substantial collaborations that, uh, that help clinicians achieve the goals that they have when they go to work every day. So with that, um, I'm happy to turn it over to questions and 
I know that uh, there are a lot of people on this call with uh, serious experience in practice-based research and serious training in methodology. That's not me. I, I come at it from the clinical side and, um, and really can, can help think about how you can create those kinds of collegiality and partnership. And thanks for the work that all of you do. And thanks for giving me an opportunity to meet with you this morning. Thank you so much, Dr. Barron. Incredibly, incredibly um, inspirational words. So I'm going to call on Dr. Paul Weber to go straight into questions. Who has his hand raised? Paul, I invite you to un unmute yourself. Thank you very much, Anne, and also Dr. Barron for your very, I'll call it enthralling presentation. And I wanted to make a couple, couple comments. Um, first, as you described at the end, it, it sounded to me like you're really talking about not only engagement, but uh, tapping into intrinsic motivation of everyone that's involved in the care of the patient. And so for me, that sounds to me like a wonderful opportunity to facilitate interprofessional collaborative care, which is really the essence of where we are and certainly where we're gonna, where we're gonna go to an even greater degree going forward. The other um, point I wanted to make for you or actually ask you is from uh, you know, what you've learned about this network and your experience, uh, how do you foresee the data that would be generated out of uh, practice-based networks um, being migrating into the Choosing Wisely campaigns that, uh, that happened and, and the uh, recommendations that happened from the various societies? Great questions, Paul, both. And first of all, uh, I completely endorse and violently agree with the appeal to intrinsic motivation. And I think um, that is way more powerful than extrinsic motivation in engaging people. And instead of making people do stuff, uh, trying to engage people in doing it is a much more successful strategy. And you mentioned Choosing Wisely, and you're absolutely right. Choosing Wisely was built on the whole concept that intrinsic motivation is where we want to go. And Choosing Wisely was about, gee, um, we all know that there are services that are done more than they should be. And we invited, from the ABIM Foundation, we invited varieties of professional societies to step up in the same way, use the same process they had for generating uh, care monographs or standards of care or guidelines to generate a list of five things that were done too much. What that does, what Choosing Wisely did and the most effective uses of Choosing Wisely have been when in regional local centers like you are creating here and you manifest here, people could bring the analytics together to say, what is the rate at which we're doing MRIs for low back pain? What is the rate at which we're, uh, we're ordering antibiotics uh, on initial presentations with upper respiratory symptoms? These are, these are questions. What Choosing Wisely created was a list of five professionally recognized things that we do too much of, but most people in practice don't have access to rate-based data on the rate at which they are doing those things. So I would absolutely endorse and encourage uh, if, if the network wanted to focus on implementation of choosing wisely recommendations, that would be a great set of things. And, and in general, what we've seen is that works best when a local area decides that something is important to them, either because they think they're doing it a lot or because they think they're harming patients by doing it more than they should, or sometimes because they just signed a value-based contract where now all of a sudden doing that stuff is, is, not, is hurting performance in the value-based contract. But it requires a level of, of local buy-in and local salience. And from our point of view, and we've seen a lot of people do this, Fred Hutchinson did it in, in uh, the, their cancer network in, in Washington. They looked at a set of choosing wisely recommendations that were important to them, measured in a set of practices what uh, uh, adherence to those recommendations was. It varied a lot. They focused on the practices that were high outliers and those practices came down. So I, I think uh, choosing wisely, uh, many of them, not all of them lead to simple measurement, but the ones that lead to clear measures, uh, I, I think they are very prime uh, for what you're, what you're uh, proposing to do here. Thanks for that question, Paul. It's a great question. Thank you. <laughs> Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to try to honor the two raised hands, and I know there's a question in the chat box, which uh, Dr. Barron, if you're able to respond to it after, uh, in the interest of time, just to make sure we, we stay on schedule. So next up is Mary O'Dowd. Could you unmute yourself? 
Thank you for taking my question. Um, when you were talking about your learned experience with um, uh, electronic medical records, I was thinking about the potential opportunity to learn um, on telemedicine now. And it occurred to me that um, for the, in the last year and a half, I've had two experiences. One where I, bless you, went into the office and had a visit in person. And my physician said to me, you know, we could have done this via telemedicine. <laughs> and I thought, I thought the same thing, but why didn't we? And then I had another experience with my child who was sick that where I did go through telemedicine, it was kind of difficult. Uh, a pediatric visit is quite different sometimes. And um, we managed through it. But there's a question in my mind about how we're going to use telemedicine moving forward. And I worry that the decision making will be as you sort of talked about the compliance officer, I think being the, the person guiding that decision versus the experience for the patient, um, the experience for the provider, um, and the effectiveness of the interaction, which I would hope would be driving some of these decisions about how we use telemedicine. It might not be, it might be about who's paying for what, or you know, convenience factors versus um, quality. And so I wonder if you have any thoughts about how we might think about that in this, this new era that we find ourselves in. That's a great question. And, and telemedicine is, of course, now a, a uh, natural experiment at scale. Um, and, and, and it's out there and it is crying out for the kind of resources that you all could bring to it. And I think you're asking the right questions uh, of things we don't know about telemedicine. Who's using it? Why are they using it? Um, what is their experience using it? Uh, and, and how does it compare uh, to, to the other ways that things were done? I think those are all really important things. Uh, another thing that I've thought about with telemedicine and this more from the board work, you know, we, we know that doctors vary a lot in how successfully they communicate. And we've never had a very good way at getting a look at communication skills. And uh, w one of my favorite studies in surgery uh, was where they took laparoscopic surgery, which creates a video record. They invited surgeons to send their best video record, their best, uh, to a panel of, of uh, expert physicians and be graded. And the physicians grading only the, the video record of the surgery predicted the length of stay and complications based on the surgical technique that they saw uh, on, on, the, uh, on the video. And I think we could do that with communication skills too in a different way with peer reviews of, of communication skills. So I think you're right. It's a, it's a very fertile field to be looking at. Uh, and I think, you know, as with any research issue, what you want to do is define the questions you're trying to answer. Um, I added one to your list. How effectively are people communicating? And uh, as judged by peers or patients uh, is, is a kind of, I think, new, new domain here. But thank you. And I hope you will do some work on, on telemedicine. Uh, Dr. Peskin, why don't you go next? And then I'll take the one from the chat. And then I Thanks. think we're out of time. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, and I mirrored your point um, in the research network on the call. We're very excited at Horizon to, to pursue that website manners and the effectiveness of telemedicine, where to apply it, how, how it's to be measured. So that's just a sidebar comment. My question for you, uh, having been a long fan of Choosing Wisely since its launch in 2012, what lessons learned would you share that reduce the ability to scale choosing wisely. Uh, again, I'm a huge fan, as you know, but uh, kind of the, the, the best lessons we learn are the ones where we, you know, maybe, uh, you know, don't do what we hope to accomplish. So if you could comment on that. So I think, I think the most important lesson from choosing wisely is the one Dr. Weber referred to of, of appealing to intrinsic motivation. Um, because choosing wisely never went out there uh, to, to try to uh, solve the problem of the rising cost of healthcare in America or make care more affordable. That, that was not uh, the goal and purpose of the campaign. The idea was if we're going to get there at all, 
we need to get a bunch of people in, in the game who are not in the game now. And, and Choosing Wisely got a lot of people in the game in a lot of places around the country. And I think it did that by, by appealing to intrinsic motivation, by trying to, uh, to, to build agency. Um, the latest thing we're doing at the foundation relates to trust. And we are thinking a lot about the way in which we in healthcare assume we have trust because we have science, because we're right. And of course, we've just lived through a, a multi-year period where science has been devalued, facts have been destroyed. And we're realizing that, that people don't just believe stuff because it was in the New England Journal. They don't just take the vaccine because of the incredible uh, reactions for the vaccine trial. So we're very interested in moving into the area of using trust as building trust as a core organizational strategy, which often has organizations thinking about things that are important to the people that they serve rather than the things that are necessarily important to the organizations. And boy, did we learn that uh, at, at EBIM that we needed to think differently about, about our customers. So I think intrinsic motivation agency uh, are the most important aspects of scale. And then what you get is you get, you get movement at scale, but then you can't necessarily, uh, in, in the way that you would in a research paper for the New England Journal, attribute the change to that. You sort of have to give up on that and say, if we can get people in the game, we've been successful. And I do wanna take the, the uh, question in chat because I think it's important. And I think it is, um, pick any organization, um, whether it's a, a, a clinical organization with, with uh, frontline clinical teams and administrators or an insurance company or, or, or a, a university, uh, there, there tends to be a huge gap between management and everybody else. And everybody else feels like management doesn't know what's going on. And, and, um, and management gets frustrated that you know, people seem to be against them. I think clinicians often, uh, in a way that I don't think is constructive, uh, conspire with their patients. You know, when people come and complain about the parking or the appointment system, the doctors say, oh, I hate that appointment system too, but the patient can't change it, the doctor can. I, I think it's not so much that, that these systems are being run by, uh, by non-clinicians, which to some extent they are, uh, you know, early in my career, when I was chief medical officer at Health Partners, which was a Medicaid HMO at a time that neither Medicaid nor HMOs were popular, if I go to a cocktail party, people would say to me, um, uh, oh, we're so glad you're there because we know you'll get it right. We know you'll be sure that the right thing happens. To which my response was, I'm so grateful that you said that. I, I appreciate the confidence in me. But I got to tell you, when I sit at the management table, there's a marketing person, there's a finance person, there's an IT person. I don't know how to run a program that doesn't run afoul of the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission hiring and firing policies. So it takes a team to run a place. The clinicians have an important voice, but they don't have the only voice. Did I just well, leave Dr. you? <laughs> oh, we heard. Thank you so much, Dr. Barron. Um, for